Today's scripture is from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 21 through 37, the New Living Translation. You have heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. When you are on the way to court with your adversary, settle your differences quickly. Otherwise, your accuser may hand you over to the judge who will hand you over to an officer and you will be thrown into prison. And if that happens, you surely won't be free again until you have paid the last penny. You have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. You have heard the law that says, a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorce. But I say that a man who divorces his wife, unless she has been unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. You have also heard that our ancestors were told you must not break your vows. You must carry out the vows you make to the Lord. But I say, do not make any vows. Do not say, by heaven, because heaven is God's throne. And do not say, by the earth, because the earth is his footstool. And do not say, by Jerusalem, for Jerusalem is the city of the great king. Do not even say, by my head, for you can't turn one hair white or black. Just say a simple, yes, I will, or no, I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Catherine. Will you pray with me this morning? Oh Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. For we know that you, you are our rock. You are our Redeemer. Amen. There's a church in Columbia, South Carolina. It's near a seminary that has one of those boards out front that lists the service times, that lists the special events, sermon subjects, those kind of things. And David Leininger, a Christian author, writes that for several years there was one other thing on that board. One of those little one-sentence sermons that we see so often. And it said the same Bible that says believe also says behave. Now, I don't know if there's any significance to the fact that this was located near a seminary or not. Perhaps someone figured the students needed to see it more than anybody else, but at any rate, that one-sentence sermon on that sign was there for a very long time. The same Bible that says believe also says 
behave. Think about that for a moment. The same Bible that says believe also says behave. And here's something else I found really intriguing. Interesting, maybe slightly worrisome. There's a book that is titled, What is the Least I Can Believe and Still Be a Christian? It's by a pastor named Martin Thielen, and some reviewers and some teachers say that it's actually useful and it's helpful for those who want to know the essence of the faith. But a title like that, that kind of seems to go against the teaching of our text from our gospel reading this morning. What a fun text that is this morning. Catherine had the joy of reading that text. Jesus is raising the standard of behavior in this text. He is making it harder, it seems, to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus. He wants us to go further, to go deeper. In short, he is asking us not to simply follow the rules, but to consider how our behavior, how our actions, how our choices, how our attitudes, how everything impacts the wider community around us. And we are called to think about our influence, how Christians are called to influence their world in a positive way. I talked about it last week, the, the salt and light, and how whether we want to be or not, and whether we realize it or not, we are the salt, we are the light. Like I said, whether you want to be or not, whether you realize it or not, we are the salt, we are the light. We are what who people see. We are the Jesus that people see. And we also see in our gospel text this morning a call to be forgiving and a call to work towards reconciliation in our relationships. Relationships within the community of Christ and the community of believers in the body of believers is so important. But so is the relationship of the church with the wider community. So, when you look at this gospel reading this morning, perhaps you think Jesus comes across as a hardline preacher. This is part of his Sermon on the Mount still. And if you really pay attention to what he said, it can make us uncomfortable because he speaks at that about things that we all do. All of us. He talks about anger, resentment, resentment to other people, quarreling, lying, all the games we play with the truth. And then he talks about things that make us squirm a little bit, that make us even more uncomfortable. He talks about uncontrolled sexual desire. He talks about disruption of marriages. All these things are against God's law, he says. And he says they can lead to condemnment, condemnation and judgment. But it doesn't really end there. If we keep reading beyond today's text and the next few chapters and verses, we hear Jesus speaking against re retaliation. Against retaliation for the injuries and telling us to love our enemies as well as our friends. Don't just love the people that are nice to you.
things that make us uncomfortable. We don't really want to hear these things. Because we know that these words of Jesus, they zero in on who we really are. They unmask our pretenses about righteousness, self-righteousness. And it reveals the sinner behind the mask. We like to skim lightly over these passages and sweeten them up a little bit and get, you know, get to something less worrisome, less demanding, but we'll never get better. We never begin the process of healing. Have you ever thought about that sin is a cancer that goes deeper than the actions that other people can see? It infects everything, our hearts, our minds, our fears and our desires and our fantasies that are so embedded in who we are that we may not even notice how it gets into our system. Sin is the ways in which we picture ourselves as righteous, even at the expense of others. Or the games we play with the lies that we tell to make them seem true. We go in a direction opposite of God's will on a path that leads to final separation from God. Jesus knew that learning the rules was a common exercise. And that's why he took the time to talk about the rules in the Sermon on the Mount. He knew that he was in a rule-based society. So he decided to take a look at the rules and turn things upside down like he was known to do. He said, you thought you knew this rule. Basically said, well, listen to this. You've heard it said, but then let me say to you. Read these verses and tell me you aren't overwhelmed. Like I said, just a little bit. I mean, rules are one thing. This seems to be a bit much. Extreme rules, intense rules, rules only for those who are really into rules or something like that. But yet when we read these verses, it seems like this higher standard is something more than adding to the list of rules. It says that if Jesus is getting, trying to get us to realize something something important about ourselves and about our relationships. And maybe it's just something as simple as saying, hey, pay attention. Or these relationships are precious. Treat them with care. Or maybe community is a gift from God. Don't waste it. Don't abuse it. Don't ignore it. It see, it seems that all of these rules, all these higher ways of living are about community, relationships. And Jesus is saying that we ought not take anyone for granted. We ought not run the risk of hurting anyone. We ought not treat anyone as less than a child of God. These aren't rules as much as a way of creating community that resembles the kingdom of God. The community of faith can be 
about the little details of daily living or about revolutions and transformation and maybe even about both at the same time. I mean, we, most of us are on Facebook. Most of us see the little details. I ate at this restaurant today. Look at that wonderful meal I just ate. Which is always fun and good. Or we, some of us put on there, or some people, their, their concerns, their heartache. When you're in a relationship with the body of Christ, you have the opportunity to share those details with one another and grow together. The body of Christ is a community of respect, of joy, a caring community of hope, of affirmation. We're a Christ-breathed community of transformation and spiritual growth. So yeah, it does seem that Jesus lays down the law in this part of the Sermon on the Mount. But like I mentioned a, a little bit earlier, a few chapters later, we hear the same Jesus speaking quite differently. Jesus says, Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Man, that sounds different than Jesus we heard in the gospel reading this morning. But notice Jesus does not say, come to me and forget about those demands of the law. It is precisely the people who had heard the unqualified demands of the law who took them seriously and who felt convicted by them who Jesus says, I will give you rest. And as we read through the Gospels, we're struck by the fact that Jesus, who could come across as a strict teacher of the law's demands, seems so often himself to be associated with the sinners. If you've watched The Chosen, some of the most powerful images are when he calls the disciples or when he associates with the sinners. In the setting of the Gospels, the close contacts that the Jewish tax collectors had to, they had to have with Gentiles made it difficult for them to follow the strict demands of the Jewish laws, the laws that were given by Moses. They were widely seen as dishonest by their fellow Jews. But Jesus called a tax collector to follow him and to be his disciple. And then he followed that by sitting down and having dinner with tax collectors and sinners. Well, the Pharisees, the morality police, didn't like that. They were offended by his behavior and his Jesus' friends in low places. And they ask, why does Jesus eat with people like that? But Jesus said that we have to be more righteous than his critics. And his response to them was, I've come to heal the sick, not those who think that they're already healthy. Jesus' mission is to save people who have failed to keep the law. Which really, when you come down to it, means everybody. Everybody. Paul writes in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And as we read through the Gospels, we see Jesus moving closer and closer to the cross. 
He'll be condemned as a breaker of the law and rejected as one of the unrighteous, accepting the, the consequences of human sin. All of our sin. Have you ever thought about the fact that the death sentence upon lawbreakers is carried out upon the one who gave the law? Death sentence upon lawbreakers is carried out upon the one who gave the law. Through Jesus, God becomes a participant in our story, not as a judge or an executioner, but as one on our side, taking our place and paying the penalty for our sin. But that's not the end of the story. On the third day, he rose from the dead and proclaimed, peace be with you. He declares that to his discouraged and his fearful disciples. Peace be with you. The penalty for death has been paid and fellowship with God has been restored. And that's the way the message has been presented. It's true as far as it goes, but if it stops there, something essential is missing. What Jesus has done by his life and death and resurrection is more than, more than just a legal transaction. By proclaiming God's love for us through the sharing of our life and dying our death, he has shown us that God is indeed to be trusted above all things in life and in death. And it is that faith and trust in God that is the true restoration of, of a right relationship with our Creator. I mean, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus states the law's demands quite strictly. Even minor infractions are condemned. But that same Jesus, that same Jesus invites and welcomes sinners, those who have broken the law, which is everybody, and he dies for them and for us. And the fact that death could not hold him means that he is the one in whom we could place our deepest trust. Jesus says we are the light. We are the salt. Jesus says we are blessed. But Jesus also says we are sinners in need of redemption and salvation. And Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. Trust me and I will give you peace. Do you trust Jesus? Do you know Jesus? I pray that you do. I pray that you allow yourselves to be a light and a salt and the hands and feet of Jesus. The world needs that love and that peace and that reconciliation. To God be the glory. And amen.